Atlético. Uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Swasta Vidya lecture series by Homi Baba National Institute. In today's SBNI Health and Fitness Lecture, talking about cancer, preventions, early detections, diagnosis, and treatment. These four topics will be covered today. We have two practicing oncologists from Tata Memorial Center, uh, properly known as TMC, and uh, in uh, local uh, ground it's known as Tata Hospital. Both these speakers are HBNI professors in medical and health sciences. Uh, in fact, uh, as you know, the, all, both the doctors have long and uh, very big uh, biodata with uh, many awards and other things. However, as per suggestion from the speakers, I'm just going to introduce them one or two sentences. The first speaker is Dr. Gauravi Misra. Uh, she is working in Department of Preventive Oncology, EMC. She received many awards. Notable among them is MDD Gilders Award, 1997, awarded for securing the highest marks at Diploma in Public Health Examination conducted by CPS. Our second speaker is Dr. Sripad Banawari, Director Academics, TMC, and ex ed Department of Medical and Pediatric Oncology, TMC. He also received many awards. Notable among them is Lokmat Maharashtrian of the Year 2018. I am thankful to both the doctors for spelling their time from their busy schedule. Dear participants, I am glad to announce that doctors have agreed to answer the queries after end of their lectures. May I request the participant to put up their queries in chat mode. Thanks to the participants for joining online for the webinar. And I request doctors to deliver their lectures. Thank you, doctors. And thank you all. May we request all other participants to keep their audio muted so that there is no disturbance. May we request all other participants who are not speaking to keep their audio muted. Thank you very much. Dr. Mishra, please. Thank you. Uh, at the, good afternoon, everyone. And at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity that you gave us to interact with everyone and uh, uh, spread awareness regarding prevention and early detection of uh, common cancers. Uh, it, it's uh, a great privilege to be uh, uh, there with the HBNI organizing this particular event. So whatever queries uh, you have, we'll be very happy to take at the end of both the sessions. Uh, I will be dealing with uh, prevention and early detection of common cancers. So uh, uh, this is uh, the map of the world. And you can see uh, there are some areas that are really dark in color and some which are very light in color. So the dark areas are the ones that denote cancer incidence, which is very high. This is not in, in terms of numbers, but in terms of what we call as the age standardized incidence rate. That means per 100,000 population, how many people are affected with cancer. If you look at the map carefully, then you realize that the Western countries, the US, Canada, Australia, they have very high uh, incidence of cancers. As compared to that, if you look at India, 
the map of india it's quite uh, light so um, uh, as we uh, if we compare ourselves to many other countries then our cancer incidence is low but then why are we so much worried about cancer the reason is that uh, the incidence is growing rapidly it's rising rapidly and secondly in terms of the population we have a large population base so uh, even if the incidence is little lesser as compared to other countries the numbers the volumes are really really huge um, and that is the reason for the worry uh, coming directly to what are the common cancers that are affecting indian population so some cancers that may be common in us or in australia they may not be so common in our country whereas there are some peculiar cancers that are common in our country and mainly related to the lifestyle why i'm stressing on the lifestyle is these are reversible cancers that are reverse, i mean the, these cancers can be prevented not reversible but they are, they can be completely prevented by changing the lifestyle for example the most common cancer that we see, see among men in india is the lip and the oral cavity cancer it accounts for nearly 16% of the cancers that we see among all men in india can you imagine a big bulk 16% of the cancers of oral cavity and we all know the common reason behind it is our rampant use of tobacco in all forms the chewing forms mainly and also the smoking forms and even in the smokeless forms we have a wide at least 100 different varieties of smokeless forms that are consumed by our population the second most common cancer among men in india is the lung cancer and again completely preventable cancer related to smoking habits cigarette smoking bd smoking hookah smoking etc stomach cancer colorectum esophagus again these cancers are related to the use of tobacco and alcohol so these are again uh, very much preventable cancers and that's why our focus rather than talking about uncommon cancers we will talk today only about the common cancers and the cancers that can be either prevented or detected early if you look at the female population look at it and pink color the breast cancer the more than 26% of the cancers that affect our indian women are breast cancers now breast cancer it's not a preventable cancer to a large extent but it it is a cancer that can be detected early by regular examinations and screening and that is what we'll be discussing today the uterine cervix cancer again this is affects 18% of the women who are affected with cancers 18% of the women who get cancer in our country they get uterine cervix cancer this is a very much preventable cancer this cancer has a very large pre cancerous phase during which if the woman is examined at by regular screening she can be detected early and cured then ovarian cancer again lip and oral cavity cancer is common even among women in india because of the tobacco use habits and the colorectal cancer these are the common cancers among men and women in india in india we see nearly 1.3 million new cancer cases every year and nearly 0.9 million people die of cancer every year in our country uh, the common uh, question people ask is uh, what causes cancer why is it uh, that cancer happens to anyone now uh, many are lifestyle related factors but uh, there are also some infectious causes like viruses and bacteria radiation exposure and some chemical exposure and there are some cancers which are hereditary which cannot be prevented a lot of it is related to uh, diet and hormones also and we will be talking about these cancers uh, if we actually look at all the non communicable diseases including diabetes cardiovascular diseases and stroke and also cancers then we see that there are four common risk factors that are shared by all these diseases cancers diabetes cardiovascular diseases and stroke and if we control this four risk factors then we can uh, prevent and control lot of cardiovascular diseases diabetes cancer and uh, chronic respiratory diseases and the four most important risk factors in our life are the use of tobacco the use of alcohol unhealthy diet and lack of physical activity and we have to focus on these four modifiable shared risk factors and so many of the non communicable diseases and cancers can be prevented
Now, um, this is a very common sight. Wherever we go, we see a tobacco shop. Anywhere in the country you go and you see a tobacco shop and you see a lot of uh, smoking and smokeless forms of tobacco being sold. And this is the most avoidable cause of cancer in the entire world. Tobacco habit, it kills nearly 8 million people each year. And again, it is not that it's just the direct smoking that kills people, but secondhand smoke, that is you breathing, the children and the spouses breathing uh, the smoke that is exhaled by a tobacco smoker also is harmful. So... Uh, these are the different types that you of tobacco use that we see in India. And of course, there are at least 100 different varieties of, to, in, of ways by which tobacco is consumed. In Maharashtra, we see people applying, women applying burnt tobacco known as mashiri to their teeth, which is again extremely harmful. Uh, it, it is not that just tobacco causes cancer, but it also causes several, it affects sev most of the organs in the body and affects in one way or the other. It is not just related to cancers, but many non-communicable diseases and it has a, an ill effect on health. Coming to cancers, tobacco, you all know that tobacco causes lung cancer and oral cavity cancer. But again, it is related to at least cancers of 14 different sites in the body, including kidney, ureter, bladder, esophagus, stomach, liver, larynx, pharynx, colon, uh, and also some of the blood cancers. Uh, pe many people are aware about the alcohol cessation clinic, but similarly, we do have a tobacco cessation clinic in which we counsel, do behavioral counseling and help a people, help the tobacco users to quit the habit. So anyone who wants to avail this facility, we are, uh, this tobacco cessation clinic is attached to the Department of Preventive Oncology and wherein we do pharmacotherapy, and behavioral therapy and help an individual to quit tobacco. So tobacco is not just an individual uh, problem. It um, has to be ta uh, tackled with a multi-pronged approach. It's not uh, just the legislation or regulation that's going to help, but increasing the taxes also works well. But mainly educating the population so that there is no demand, that, so that the demand of tobacco itself is less. That will go a long way in reducing the problem. Of course, actually, advertisements regarding uh, about tobacco are banned in all the print media, uh, on the television also. But our actors, uh, who are quite influential in uh, influencing the adolescents and the adult um, and the te teenagers, uh, they are shown smoking in the movies. There are specific ads which are directed so that the women start smoking. Uh, and this is especially seen in European countries wherein lot of ads focus towards the women and women are taking up smoking in a big way. Again, uh, as I said, uh, one of the most important uh, effect of tobacco other than cancer is on the heart. It is a very important risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, for strokes. Uh, it also causes infertility in, men, uh, in women and importance in men. And this is how a smoker's lung looks like. It is totally black in color. In, uh, when you come to the preventive oncology clinic, even if you don't have any uh, symptoms, if you are a tobacco user, please visit the preventive oncology clinic of the Tata Memorial Hospital. It is for people who don't have cancers and uh, uh, we examine you with a very simple examination with a good light source. And if there is any precancerous lesion, it can be easily identified on examination. This white patch that you see inside the oral cavity it is a leukoplakia or the precancer of the oral cavity. These are different precancerous lesions, the white patch and the red patch, the leukoplakias and the erythroplakias, which are very commonly seen among the tobacco users. And if they leave the habit even at this stage, these are reversible conditions. And that is why our focus is on reversing and preventing the development of an oral cancer. Now, if you look at this man, he's trying to open his mouth, but he cannot open his mouth any further. This is because of the fibrous bands that have developed in his mouth. This is also known as the log jaw or the submucous fibrosis condition, which is very common among the Gutka users and users of betel nuts. People feel that supari or betel nut, it is not carcinogenic, but actually it is highly carcinogenic and it can uh, lead to submucous fibrosis, which further progresses into cancer. These are all cancers because people have a habit that they chew tobacco and then they park it at some particular uh, place in the mouth. This is park 
just uh, inside the lips where the cancer is developing. And these are all the cancer uh, patients from our OPDs. We see several new cancer cases every day in our OPD. Uh, they have just come because they feel that there is some ulcer in the oral cavity or something. And then uh, we uh, examine them and there is a frank cancer which is just coming out. These uh, patients come from all over India to our clinic. And that is the reason many of the patients, they come at very la uh, last stages of the disease. So the point to be taken here is early detection only means successful treatment. And please, anyone who is a tobacco user, we can help you quit tobacco in our tobacco cessation clinic. We can uh, screen you regularly and see if there is any precancerous lesion that has developed. Other than tobacco, uh, some of the chemicals like radon or asbestos, they are also, or arsenic, they are also known to have carcinogenic potential. What we will talk about is alcohol. Again, there is a lot of uh, focus on alcohol uh, being a very responsible cause of cancer and it causes cancer at least of seven different sites in the body, including oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, that is our throat part, esophagus, stomach, colon, rectum, liver. It is also known to be associated with breast cancer and ovarian cancers. So it is again not just regulation of alcohol distribution that's going to work and restriction of ban of advert or advertising uh, or banning the advertisement but also increasing the prices and more importantly creating awareness amongst the people about not using alcohol to a large extent now um, uh, coming to occupational cancers there are more than 40 agents in the working environment that are carcinogenic to humans and they cause cancers of different parts of the bodies most workplaces, they take nowadays adequate precautions to see that the workers, uh, the, employer, uh, the, uh, the employees are safe and not exposed to this carcinogenic chemicals. Some of the places where we can make changes, physical inactivity. Physical inactivity is known to be associated with cancers and sedentary behavior or not being physical act, physically active is linked to colorectal cancer, that is cancers of our large intestine and endometrial cancers, that is the cancers of the, our uterus. And uh, if you're physically active, then it really decreases the risk of having a postmenopausal breast cancer. And it also reduces the incidence of your large intestine cancer and the uterine cancers. Now, uh, uh, this, there are several mechanisms by which it acts, but mainly it lowers the levels of hormones that are associated with the cancer development and progression. And this is something that we all should be doing, remaining physically active. It, it will prevent not only cancers, but several other non-communicable diseases. Now, having healthy diet, maintaining healthy weight and being physically active is important. Uh, preventing obesity is important because obesity itself is linked to several cancers. Now, here you see that these are all the cancers that are linked to obesity. And here in all the cancers that are linked to unhealthy diets, again, which uh, predisposes a person to obesity. So uh, uh, if you look at our country, yes, uh, we are also growing in size, but compared to the Western population, wherein uh, the dark areas, it uh, signifies the fractions of the cancers, all the cancers that are attributable to obesity. And if you look at US, Canada, uh, you will see that more than 5% of the cancers are uh, that happen in that population are attributable to obesity. Whereas in India, it is uh, less than 1% of the population, uh, which is still uh, uh, the cancers that are attributable to obesity, but the incidence may, fa may fast rise. So these are the number of cancers that are um, uh, associated with obesity all across the globe. And you can see that so many cancers of colon, kidney, gallbladder, pancreas, and the organs, they are linked to obesity. Uh, there are cancers which are caused by infection and preventing infection by uh, getting the vaccine and treating the infections appropriately can prevent this uh, cancers. Uh, we all immunize our kids and we have all have taken hepatitis B vaccine and hepatitis B virus we know is linked to liver cancers. Similarly, helicobacter uh, pylori uh, uh, it is linked to uh, stomach cancers, the human papilloma virus. It is linked to not only cervical cancers, but cancers of 
uh, other genital urinary organs and this all cancers can be prevented by appropriately treating the infection so there are cancers that are caused by infections and then there are cancers that are caused by ultraviolet uh, ultraviolet radiation or uv radiation exposure but these cancers are not very common in india uh, whereas in some countries like australia north america this can your of this cancers are very high now i'll speak uh, on two main cancers that affect uh, uh, the women in india the number one is the breast cancer and the second one is the uterine cervix cancer this is um, the map of the world which shows the most common cancer in that particular country and if you look carefully the entire world appears pink in color that means that breast cancer is not the most common cancer just in india but it's the most common cancer in most countries across the globe except a few countries in africa where in cervical cancer still remains the most common cancer uh, though it is the most common cancer in india if you look at uh, the incidence of cancer across the globe then we realize that the incidence of cancer it's again much higher in western countries as compared to india because india is still in a quite in a light, lighter shade if we we'll talk about a standardized incidence in india of breast cancer it is nearly 26 whereas in us it is 90 so uh, uh, for them the breast cancer incidence is much higher than as compared to india but in terms of numbers we have huge number because of our population base so what are the risk factors for breast cancer you have to remember that each and every woman is at risk of getting a breast cancer however the risk increases with age and it varies with country and these are the most common risk factors for breast cancer having a family history early menarche that is a woman starting menstruating very early in her um, uh, childhood uh, late menopause late marriage late pregnancy uh, having no children or not breastfeeding the children uh, obesity uh, diet which is rich, rich in fat and alcohol and having a benign breast disease we need to avoid all this junk food and a uh, bottle feeding and we have to uh, adopt a healthy lifestyle this is the anatomy of the uh, breast so you have to realize that the breast has several lobules uh, uh, and ducts uh, so if the cancer affects the lobules it's a lobular carcinoma if it affects the ducts it's a ductular carcinoma that it can affect also the nipple area and um, if uh, not detected early it can spread to the muscles underneath and uh, they this breast tissue it drains into the axillary nodes so if the uh, uh, if it, uh, uh, the axillary nodes also have to be removed during the surgical procedures early signs of breast cancer breast is it's an external organ and, and it's um, an easily detect detectable cancer a lump in the breast especially a lump which does not move Uh, and does not pain it is a uh, an important sign of breast cancer dimpling of the skin over the breast because there is some lump that is pulling the skin of the breast inside and that's one of the sign of breast cancer nipple discharge especially if it is a blood stained nipple discharge and nipple retraction that is the nipple which was uh, outside in the recent recently it has it is being pulled inside so that's an important sign of uh, breast cancer so there are several lumps in the breast they all are not carcinogenic and uh, we need not think that each and every lump in the breast is carcinogenic and there are mainly three methods to detect breast cancer early that is the breast self examination clinical breast examination and mammography in breast self examination we teach the women to examine their own breast to stand in front of the mirror just once in a month not every day just once in a month and to examine her breast carefully and if a woman is still menstruating then she has to do it between 7th to 10th day of her menstrual cycle counting the day that she starts menstruating as a day one if she is a post menopausal woman then she can uh, just um, uh hold any one day in the month like day 1 of the month or day 15th of the month and do it on that particular day every month she first stands in front of the mirror and sees if both the breast are of the same size both the nipple are in the uh, at the same level etc 
then the same changes are seen um, with the hands raised you also see whether the nipple are retracted or if there is there any bulging if there is any dimpling of the skin over the breast and then the women examines her breast with all the four fingers together and in a clockwise direction starting from 12 o'clock from outside the circumference uh, and then coming towards the nipple and then she goes at one o'clock again comes towards the nipple and in this way she covers the entire breast she can also examine the breast uh, while taking a shower and also she needs to examine the breast in the in the lying down position also because some lumps are best uh, felt in sitting or standing position while others are best felt in the lying down position also the breast has to be examined with slight tilt at 45 degrees and, uh, angle so that the lateral side of the breast is also covered the women has to squeeze the nipple from areola that is a brown part which surrounds the nipple is areola from areola outwards not just pinch the nipple and see if there is any discharge coming out if there is a blood stream discharge it's really um, she needs to get herself examined to see if there is something when you come to the preventive oncology opd in fact i would encourage all the women who are about 30 years to get themselves examined either uh, uh, to a near, to their nearest hospital or you are all welcome to tata memorial hospital preventive oncology department and this is the way that we examine you uh, we uh, first make you lie down and examine the uh, the breast uh, completely and then in the sitting position and uh, if required, and all the women above 50 years are also advised mammography, that is X-ray of the breast. So the breast is compressed between two X-ray plates. And if there is any small lump also, that is clearly visible to us. If there is any small lump, then we insert a needle and take, collect the cells on the slides, which is known as FNAC. And we may also use a, a, a biopsy, that is, we may remove the lump to examine if there is some uh, a cancerous development inside. So the entire idea of screening or early detection is to detect the, the, the cancer or the lump when it is at a very early stage. So it can be uh, removed and the entire, uh, there is no need to remove the entire breast. There is absolutely no need of a mastectomy if the lump is very small. But if someone comes at a stage when the cancer is spread all over the breast, then we need to do a mastectomy or remove the breast. But if, the can if some patients come to us when the cancer is already spread to all other organs also, in that case, uh, uh, the patient goes in palliation. We uh, cannot perform uh, the surgery, but just give radiation to decrease the uh, pain and give painkillers. And uh, uh, if the breast is spared, that is, if you're doing just lumpectomy and not removing the entire breast, then the patient is also advised radiotherapy. Uh, many a times the patient is advised everything, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, and uh, uh, also hormone therapy. Dr. Banauli will deal with this. Now coming to um, cervical cancer. Cervix is the lower part um, that is the mouth of the uterus. And again, this is a very common cancer, second most common cancer among the Indian women. So this is the mouth of the uterus uh, here. And this is how it is placed. There's a urinary, urinary bladder uh, in front the colon behind uh, this uh, organ is easily visualized when we insert a speculum in the vagina we, and it's a painless procedure for this examination so all women who are above 30 years are very much encouraged to get themselves checked anywhere or to visit preventive oncology department and this is the test that we conduct to uh, we would uh, screen you for the cervical cancer so what are the risk factors for cervical cancers uh, getting married early, having multiple pregnancies, multi uh, early pregnancies, having multiple sexual partners, and poor genital hygiene. These are the risk factors and also use of tobacco. But here and we actually know the cause of uh, cervical cancer, and that is uh, persistent infection with high-risk human papilloma virus. So you, this is a cancer that is caused by infection, which is a human papilloma virus infection which is again a very common infection. Uh, but um, in most women, it remains transient and it just goes on its own. But if it persists, then it can lead to cervical precancers, which, which can further progress to cervical cancers. So this is uh, the human papilloma virus infection. Uh, the signs of cervical cancers. 
so cervical cancer uh, it is easily identifiable by unusual bleeding or blood stain uh, vaginal discharge intermenstrual bleeding that is a women complains that uh, i get periods very frequently within 10 15 days i keep getting periods of post menopausal bleeding uh, some women come to us they say uh, that you know we had stopped menstruating but then uh, after a year i again started having my menstrual cycle so this is not a common thing if after a year again uh, someone starts bleeding that is known as post menopausal bleeding and post coital bleeding that is bleeding after an intercourse so these are all signs of cervical cancers there are different methods by which cervical cancer can be detected early uh, by taking pap smears by doing visual ex examinations by collecting the cells for hpv dna testing etc when you come to us this is a baby examine uh, you you have to remove the lower clothes and we make you lie down and insert a small speculum inside the vagina this is a painless procedure and then collect some cells uh, from the cervix we visualize the cervix Uh, we take a pap smear and also do the hpv dna test we do the bia willi etc and uh, we do all these procedures are done on the same day we do colposcopy wherein uh, it's like a microscope wherein we see the cervix several times uh, enlarged and if there is any small lesion uh, we can easily pick it up we, we can take a biopsy in the same setting again this biopsy is not a very painful procedure it's uh, done without any uh, local anesthesia if we detect any kind of pre cancer again the treatment is on opd basis like cryotherapy freezing the cervix or we remove the lower part of the cervix there is absolutely no need for hysterectomy or removing the uterus for small pre cancers uh, and uh, these uh, treatments can be easily administered so uh, Uh, the again the idea of screening is that if there is any pre cancer we can easily treat it it's a reversible condition we can prevent that women from developing a cancer and uh, but if the women already comes when the cancer is uh, there in the uterus we can still do a hysterectomy and radiotherapy and still treat the women but if she comes when the cancer is already spread everywhere then it becomes very difficult uh this again uh, uh, for prevention of cervical cancer not only screening but uh, there are vaccines available uh, currently there are two vaccines available in india uh, gerdasil and cervarix uh, these are to be given to the girls before the initiation of sexual activity if the girls take it before 15 years then just two doses at 6 months interval uh, are sufficient if they are above 15 years then they need to take three doses Uh, we still don't know whether a booster would be required in the long run but they this um, vaccines are known to prevent uh, cervical pre cancers uh, the vaccines are relatively new about 15 years old and we still don't know whether they would actually prevent cancers because uh, the girls who had received the vaccine they still have to reach the age of 50 60 years when they would be vulnerable for cervical cancers but as of now it this seem promising so uh, the vaccination program has been implemented at least in 107 countries across the globe it has been included in the national immunization program uh, in india it's still not incorporated in the national immunization program but uh, uh, we have to remember that hpv vaccination is a primary prevention tool and it does not eliminate the need of screening or early detection later in the life uh, in short uh, if you want to prevent uh, cancer maintain healthy lifestyle promote uh, dietary modification we need to be physically active uh, we need to take vaccines and uh, also get ourselves screened at regular intervals avoid tobacco and alcohol in every form and uh, take care when working in uh, the chemical industries use all the protective measures and mass education is something that is very important uh thank you this is the women's uh, cancer screening package that we have that we work um, in our department our department is located on the third floor of service block of the tata memorial hospital and uh, these are some of the warning signs of cancers uh, but, uh this is uh, uh, how you can register for the department of preventive oncology if you want to make a case file uh once again thank the organizers and i'd be happy to take any questions um, either now or at the end of dr banawli's session thank you
प्रोफेसर बडावली साहब प्लीज so once again uh, thank you professor rao and professor naik and hbni for giving us this chance to create some awareness about cancer because as we know especially in the west and in the usa now cancer has surpassed even the cardiovascular diseases as number one cause of death and as we know whatever happens in usa in few years it comes to india also so at least awareness has to be done about the subject so that uh people know what's happening so uh, i'll share my slides okay so you know the first thing and the most important thing is to prevent cancer you know if if you can prevent cancer nothing like it because prevention is much much better than cure and for a country like india a low socio economic and low and middle income country like india i think prevention is the best way to tackle cancer because you know that's the most cost effective manner if you cannot prevent it then detect early like gaurav we told so at least the common cancers that are there in india are uh, easily or uh, can be detected early so that's the second thing and if not that then comes the diagnosis early diagnosis and treatment of cancer and i would like to cover that part so many of you must have heard about this film shwas which was a marathi movie some of you may have may have also seen the movie it was released in 2004 and what the story is that basically this is a gen you know the the grandfather of the child who has retinoblastoma or cancer in both the eyes and he basically brings the child to the doctor and very importantly actually in that movie they have told that there is no medication or any treatment for this and you have to operate remove both the eyes and basically that is the only treatment not only that there is a social worker in this hospital who again meets the grandfather and tells that you know we can't do anything will not be able to help you you have to take the decision fast and take it immediately and let the child be operated and this is basically what really happens in many of the you know hospitals also and many times what happens is if you like we talk like that the first thing that is that the parents do is take the child and run away and even in, the, in this movie the grandfather takes the child and runs away from the hospital but very importantly he runs away so that he can show the child the world and he brings the child next day and gets the operated but this is not so in the hospitals many times we used to see this parents who run away from the hospital because they have been told that the eye has to be removed then basically they come back the child comes back with this type of gross disease spread the disease which is spread all over the body and then you lose the the child but very importantly i like to show this picture which was again of 2004 so this child was a patient at tata hospital even in the same year that this movie was released had retinoblastoma or the cancer in both the eyes and with just systemic therapy that is chemotherapy and local therapy in the form of laser not in radiation but that's another one in radiation we can save so many of these children so many of the eyes and to send the message outside that the only treatment is to remove the eye and that also in a child who can see the world you know is is this spread sends wrong messages to the public and then basically people go to quacks and the you know other practitioners who tell them that there is no need of surgery no need of anything and then basically the patients come with much advanced disease not only that at present for example we do even a special treatment wherein like we do angiography that is in for the heart we put a catheter and and you know this is a patient again of retinoblastoma which is seen on an ultrasound and this is what we do we put a small catheter and send it to the retina the artery which supplies the eye and you know the last part of it is you can see it is like a small hair but the our experts which are there at the tata hospital actually in interventional radiology 
they put the they put this catheter in that small artery and after that you know they inject this medicine directly into the eye actually so it's a very local infusion of that uh, of the chemotherapeutic agent and then you can see here basically this patient who had this this uh, retinoblastoma here basically after the treatment you can see that completely uh, you know is resolved so there's so much specialized treatment available now and so much can be done and as you can see as actually retinoblastoma you can see it is one of the most curative form of treatment of uh, cancer and uh, you know we can cure more than 95 97 percent of the children with various forms of therapy and this shows that i specifically showed this slide because this is a child of outcomes of cancer in pediatric patients that is children and though the word cancer is same Cancer in children is an entirely different disease than cancer in adults in the form that nearly at present more than 80-85% of children diagnosed with cancer can be cured. And as you can see here, this is way back in 1970s, you can see here 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% of children were cured of, of various cancers. But you can see in the year, this is 2005, but even in 2020 now this has even gone further and at present nearly 85% uh, of children with cancer are potentially curable. So that's very important to send the message outside that cancer in children is highly curable and that is the reason at the Tata Memorial Hospital all the treatment of cancer in children whether the patient can afford or cannot is given totally free and we have enough funds through various uh, we collect through our foundations through which we can support any child with cancer for the treatment and make sure that you know basically we cure as many children as possible with cancer even in adults it is it's good it's improving but it's not at, as good as in children but as you can see a certain cancer like this is a colon cancer this is a basically the breast cancer you can see basically over the years this is 1975 2000 and it's even going further now in 2020 but many cancers are now curable to a great extent. But still there are certain cancers like this is pancreatic cancer. You can see from 1975 to 2000 and even 2020, hardly any patients or less than 10% of patients with pancreatic cancers can be cured. Very few patients of lung cancer can be cured, though some subsets now with targeted therapy, which we will be talking later. Many, many more of these patients are now getting cured, but still a lot needs to be done in the adult cancers. Uh, and especially if you see, this is the outcome of metastatic cancer. That means the cancer that is spread it over the years, and this is right from 1978 to 2010, it, you can see that it's nearly overlaps each other. That means we have hardly made any progress in curing, though we have improved the survival or control them for certain extent, still very, very few cancer patients who have metastatic disease or disease that is spread can be cured. But that is improving and we are learning and we are improving over the years. And this can be seen again, this is data from the United States. You can see that is in 1990, the mortality that means nearly 210 or 215 cancer patients out of every 1000 uh, or two, 215 patients out of 100,000 patients used to die of cancer, but you can see this is improving now and at present 165 is the mortality rate has decreased to 165 per 100,000. So definitely we have improved and over the years you can see the number of patients surviving of cancer is again increasing. So definitely in the United States, we, there has been a great improvement in the outcome of cancer. But like I told you, that reflects in our countries after some time. And the same thing trend is being seen even in countries like India. So what are the, the, the tests that we do? You know, because I, we, this is just an overview lecture so that people know what are the different tests, what are the different treatments that are offered to this patient. This is not a dietetic type uh, talk about individual cancers, but overall if you see when a patient of cancer comes to us, what are the different tests that we do? And the first thing that we do is general tests. 
to make sure that his the patient's organs are working. That means we do a blood count, we do liver functions, renal functions, cardiac echo, etc., to make sure that the other organs of the patients are working well because then we can plan the treatment accordingly. The other tests which are there are more specific, though they are non-specific overall to diagnose the particular cancer, but there are certain markers, what we call tumor markers, which help us to diagnose a certain type of cancer, like this is the PSA, the prostate-specific antigen, which is increased in patients with, uh, with uh, prostate cancer. Though not every increased PSA is suggestive of cancer, and all these tests, though they suggest they are not diagnostic, like your alpha fetoprotein, which increases in liver cancer, in germ cell tumors, you have CA125, which increases in, in ovarian cancer, we have other tests like CA19.9, which increases in pancreatic cancer. So, so this test helps us indirectly to suggest that there may be uh, cancer in harboring in that patient, though these are not diagnostic. But if they are increased, they help us again later to, to monitor the progress of the patient. And there are certain tests which we do to see the extent of disease, like an X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, the MRI, bone scan. And now the latest, as we know, is the PET scan, which is, you know, everyone must have heard. And now what happens is most of the time, whether it's indicated or not, many of the patients who come to Tata Hospital come with a PET scan itself. So even without us even asking. Without us asking. And this is a slide which again the Gauravi had shown uh, just now. So this is oral cancer. And why I'm showing this is that now many of the tests now are being, you know, we are developing new and new biomarkers and tests to diagnose these cancers early. And one of the things which is going on, especially in the West, and it's coming even in India now, is basically to diagnose cancers in the saliva itself. So you don't even have to do a blood test or a prick to collect blood because as we know many of the can the the markers or the substances which are there in the blood in a minute quantity are also secreted in the saliva so saliva is is a part of the blood only so what they have done is they have developed this by bio, the biosensors and the basically various metrics and all through which now they can uh, they can diagnose Many of the cancers or this is getting established now, but uh, you know, ovarian cancer, uh, you know, pancreatic cancer, or oral cancer, ca or a lung cancer can be diagnosed from the saliva in the years to come. And this is one test. So even the EGFR mutation, which is there in both head and neck cancer, you can get in lung cancer. This can be diagnosed from a sal from salivary test also. And this is already available uh, in the West. So we are changing the way we are diagnosing this patient because, you know, oral, like I told, if the first aim of any, uh, this thing, science, is to prevent, and if you cannot prevent, diagnose this test, the, uh, these cancers early, and one of way to do that would be to do this salivary test in the near future, though at present it's not available in India. And this, is like I told you, this is a patient with, you know, lymphoma, blood cancer, which is, you can see this is basically extensive. So all these black dots are basically cancer. So we have extensive disease in the bones and across the body. And then this is a, the PET scan, which was done after some time. We, this is a heart and this is bladder. So this is not disease, but as you can see here, it's completely resolved. That means the whole cancer has come under control. It's, it's not there. And you know, this is very important because you know what the treatment was given for this patient? So, you know, just to, you know, I thought this was a very interesting case. I brought it here. So this patient, after this diagnosis was made, within the next few days was diagnosed to have COVID and was admitted for COVID. So he did not receive any specific disease treatment for his disease. But after the COVID, this entire disease came under control. And these are few case reports, but these are very interesting reports. And COVID has done, you know, many, many things to us how we are managing this ca these cancers and one of the thing is basically we'll have to see how we can use this uh, you know infection for our uh, to our advantage but this is a pet skin which is like i told many people are doing it now and in some cases it is definitely indicated 
and then you have specific diagnosis. The first was the general test, but the second one is a specific diagnosis because we need to have a, a definitive diagnosis to treat these patients. And for that, as we know, there are various things ways we can do. It's like FNAC or just putting a needle. We do biopsies, we do bone marrow aspirations. And now the thing that has come up a lot is what we call liquid biopsies. We'll talk about it. And then we have to look at morphology. We do the flow cytometry, we do cytogenetics, we do molecular studies. So, so many other tests are being done, specific tests to diagnose this patient. And this is what it basically is. In 1980s, initially, when you know, even we were residents at that time, an anatomical classification was good enough. That means you do a biopsy from the breast and it was labeled as breast cancer. If it was lung, it was labeled as lung cancer. A node which was positive was just labeled lymphoma. But that has changed a lot. You know, that alone is not good at all. And now in 1990s and 2000, we started making more specific histological diagnosis, for example, whether the breast cancer is ER, PR, HER2 new, these are receptors which are there. For example, in lung cancer, whether it was adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma. So all these more refined diagnoses were made and that helped us to even tailor the treatments accordingly, whether you needed just chemotherapy, you needed hormonal therapy, you needed bevacizumab like treatment. So all that was done. And now in 2010 and 2020s, we have become much even more better in the sense that we are doing more and more molecular tests and for our, for making diagnosis, that means, you know, that helps us whether not only whether the cancer is a lung cancer, but whether it has met mutation, you know, EGFR mutation, KRAS mutation, ALK mutations. And if you know that, for example, this is a ALK positive mutation with lung cancer, then you can treat this patient with ALK inhibitors, which is the more and more specific and targeted therapy. And this patient doesn't even need any chemotherapy. And even the outcomes have increased so much. I will show you in the next few slides. And that is why we have changed from just getting a histological diagnosis to what you call systems biology of cancer. And this is the era of precision medicine. So not only we are studying the primary tumors, we are doing mouse modeling, we are doing blood samples, cell cultures, we are basically doing biopsies from various places. We are doing not only the histopathology tests on them, but even genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. So, so many tests are done. And then all this data helps us to do the genotypic and phenotypic stratification. For example, here is breast cancer, where we can learn the response signatures, the resistance signatures, the adverse effect signature, then all this is incorporated into the personalized treatment of that particular patient. And this is what the expected is that this will help us improve the quality of life and also cause improved uh, survival rate. So we have changed a lot and we recently the trend has changed more further and a lot of those this has become standard of care in maybe lung cancer or some other cancers, but still a lot of work is being done on what we call liquid biopsies. That means you don't even have to do a, put a needle and do a biopsy, but just collect blood from the patient, which has usually circulating tumor cells and what we call the cell-free DNA. That means the cells which die, release the DNA into the blood and this can help us study so many things and you know help us in early intervention, uh, do the ma management after the post-treatment follow-up of the patient, study the metastatic disease, study the refractory disease, and overall, not only learn the biology of the disease, but also help to improve the outcomes. And this is why I told this is the era of precision medicine, where we treat not uh, the patient as a whole, but not, uh, you know, basically the, the paradigm shift of one size fits all. And from there, we are going to personalize on-demand precision medicine in the sense that each patient should be treated in a different way in depending on what the, the molecular or the pathways involved in that particular patient. And that is why we are having this multiple, we started with rituximab in this NTCD20 antibody in 1997, then came Tramstuzumab, which is for the or Herceptin, you must have heard, in breast cancer, imatinib or Clivec, which came for the chronic myeloid leukemia, and this is in 2016, 100 plus FDA approved targeted agent. But now in 2020, 
there are another 100 drugs which have come, uh, which are approved by FDA for targeted therapies. And very, very importantly, now we have a further tool to study because, you know, when we give medicines, the medicines are, you know, metabolized in a different way by the body. Each person has a different genotype, you know, how the drugs are metabolized, how they reach the particular tumor in that particular patient. So what we are doing now is studying in vivo what is happening to our treatment. That means not just depending on a particular, uh, you know, method of treatment, but after giving that particular treatment, how the patient or uh, the disease has responded. For example, in blood cancer, in leukemia, we give chemotherapy and after that we measure what we call the MRD or the minimal residual disease or now we call it minimal detectable disease wherein you can see in this particular patient there is no uh, disease left at all whereas in this patient you can see there is a small disease 0.04 percent still remaining and this helps us in improving the you know intensifying the treatment or changing the treatment upfront we don't have to wait at the end of one year or two years to see once the disease comes back, you know, uh, treat the patient. But at the first, this this is done usually within the first month of treatment or first two months of treatment. And upfront only we can change, modify, intensify the treatment. And this has helped us improve the outcomes of patients, especially in, in uh, blood cancer. And like I, sh I told you, for example, if there is a uh, low MRD positive, nearly 100% of this is for acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia in children. You can see nearly 100% of the children will do well if the the first time it is positive, but second time, that is by the end of second month, it becomes negative, they still do well. But if the first time and even the second time the patient uh, minimal residual disease is there, these are the ones who do not do well and then, you know, we try to even change the whole way we are treating these patients. And again, it has helped to a certain extent to improve outcome of a very small subset of patients who do not do well with so-called standard therapies. And that is why this comes to the last part of this thing, that is the treatment part. And very importantly, we have to, we always tell cancers are curable, but we have to understand that they are curable, provided they are diagnosed early, provided they are diagnosed properly, and very importantly, provided that they are treated appropriately. So if you don't do that, even a very low, low stage cancer or early cancer or a highly curable cancer like retinoblastoma or lymphoma can become incurable or basically patient can have uh, advanced disease after treatment. So we have to do diagnose them early, diagnose them properly and treat them appropriately. So what are the different types of treatment modalities of treatment available to us. The surgery, as we know, is from olden times, even, you know, in old Indian scriptures and everywhere in the Greek scripture, there is a mention of surgery uh, for, in some way for certain types of tumors. The radiotherapy came in 1904, the chemotherapy around 1950s, and now we have targeted therapy, the biological response might have modified, and the latest in this uh, modality that we have in armamentarium is the immunotherapy, which we talk, which we'll talk a little bit, but very importantly, this has helped us further to improve the outcome. And bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant that we hear is nothing but basically chemotherapy that we are giving to these patients. And this is not given alone. So usually we use combination of all these treatments. They overlap a lot, and it's not that a patient gets only one type of treatment. But how to treat this patient is the decision, for example, at, at least at the Tata Memorial Hospital and other centers is what we have a joint clinic. That means in a joint clinic where we discuss every patient, we have a surgeon, we have a radiotherapist, the medical oncologist, the pathologist, radiologist, molecular biologist, psych psychologist, social worker, and so many more. Actually, it's a full team that is required if you have to cure these patients because now with the, the, the knowledge that is pouring in in this field of oncology, no one person will be able to really do justice. And we have to take help of all this, the team that is there. And with that, we are trying to improve the outcome. There have been many advances in all the modalities of treatment. I'll just label a few, for example, advances in surgery. Very importantly, we have learned when not to operate. 
you know every surgeon can operate but a good surgeon needs to know when not to operate for example if you cannot remove the tumor in whole that means r0 means there should be no tumor left at all so you cannot cut through a tumor and this is a old saying you know grandmothers and grandfathers used to say that oh you cannot cut a, you know even biopsy they don't allow that's not right but you cannot cut through a tumor so we have seen that if you cannot do an r0 resection do not operate on the patient because it doesn't uh, help and it may actually worsen the outcome when to operate more for example you know we are doing more and more nodal resections and also there now we know when to operate more when to operate less so there are certain good risk tumors where you know we can scrape through the tumor very very few of them but definitely there are certain where you can operate less and most importantly what we have done is we are not removing the whole tumor you know the tumor so in, in once upon a time if there was an osteosarcoma we used to remove the leg retinoblastoma heard once upon a time we used to remove the eye but i like to tell you that in the last few years out of hundreds of patients we have only removed the eyeball in the child in one or two patients so very very importantly we now preserve the organ as much as possible and this is gauravi mentioned about it about the mastectomy so this in olden times we used to remove the whole breast if there was a breast cancer this is called the medical uh, the modified radical mastectomy the whole breast was removed but now we don't do that i like can see here we do what we call breast conservative surgery that means only remove the part where the tumor is there if the tumor is 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 uh, advanced to begin with we even give chemotherapy to this patient decrease the tumor and then operate but as much as possible we try to preserve the breast in breast cancer this was an old patient of osteosarcoma where we used to remove the whole leg when the tumor was there in the in the bone but now we we can see that even this large tumor which is there in this patient we have not removed the whole leg but what we have done is we have put a prosthesis inside the the body of the patient and you can see here this is a whole surgery but the leg is is preserved and we very rarely do the the you know amputation what is to call but as much as possible we try to preserve the limbs in patient with bone tumors so even in radiation therapy there have been advances and basically we you know radiation is associated with many long term complications so many of our patients now are surviving so we have to make sure that there are as less long term complications as possible so in many pediatric patients like i told you most of the pediatric patient will survive so in many of the pediatric cancers we have tried to remove the radiation therapy in total so that there are no long term side effects but wherever we require we can still use this because we have better machines we have more precise execution of radiation for example this is a stereotactic conformal radiotherapy where you can see we are giving radiation only to the tumor not only that we have what you call image modulated radiation therapy and you can see we again we try to radiate only to the tumor so that you know these are special techniques and machines which help us do that and the latest addition is this is the proton therapy which you all know is being added to our armamentarium at the actrac and this will soon start function start functioning and very importantly you can see that you know normally when you give radiation it goes through and through you know there is the entry dose and the exit dose so even the tube the whatever the tissue is there outside the tumor also gets radiated but rate the proton therapy you can see there is the entry dose but usually it just it does no exit dose so that you know you can see here uh, the radiation is only to the tumor and the other normal tissues which are there are spared so this is the gantry and this is dr badwe in our machine which is just about to start functioning within a few months this is again the same thing the normal photon radiation again affects the this thing and this is affects is very important especially for uh, you know tissues like we have a spinal column the new the nerve neural the neurological tissue which is there behind the spine which cannot tolerate high dose chemotherapy we have to preserve the heart the lungs so that you know this radiation when it goes we uh, given here for example it also affect the our tissues here but when you can see uh, in proton therapy only the tumor can be radiated and you can see uh, the other part of the the normal tissues are spared so this is a good 
treatment, especially for children, for brain tumors, and certain specialized tumors. And lastly, we have what we call the systemic therapy. You know, this used to be called chemotherapy, but we no longer call it just chemotherapy because we are along with chemotherapy, we are using a lot of other things like targeted therapies, biological response modifiers. So, you know, cancer is considered to be a systemic disease. That means if you don't treat the cancer when it is early, detected early, over time it will spread to the whole body. So for, for all practical purposes, usually a cancer detected, even if it is a local, we consider it to be a systemic disease and, you know, we try to give systemic therapy also. But as you know, chemotherapy is non-specific. It kills all dividing cells, not only the, the tumor cells, but also like blood cells, the gut cells, which are dividing. And we have injections, oral preparations, a lot of different types of chemotherapies are available, but it requires also good supportive care. And if you don't do it properly, there are a lot of side effects of chemotherapy. But I always say, you know, certain cancers like blood cancer, these are highly curable cancers, more than 90% cured, but they require chemotherapy. And I always say, if you have a thorn in the finger, you have to use a needle or another thorn to remove it. If you try to remove a thorn in the finger with a cotton wick, it will not, you cannot remove that. So there are side effects of chemotherapy, but most of these are short-term side effects. So even there are side effects, we take them and if the patient can be cured or the you know outcomes improved, we give patients chemotherapy. But since the genomic era, we know a lot of pathways involved. Now we know why cancer is developing. And if we know that, then what we do is we are using more and more targeted therapy. For example, in chronic myeloid leukemia, where we have tyrosine kinase, uh, increased activity of that uh, tyrosine kinase, which is giving proliferation advantage to this patient. We used to use chemotherapy in the past, and we can see here in the chemotherapy era, even till 2003, less than 20% of this patient would be cured, you know, over the years. But now with this GRIVAC, which is a basically a, a targeted therapy, imatinib, we have now more than 85, 90% or more than 90% patients surviving for more than 10, 20 years now, since the first, you know, the disease came in 2000, around 2000. So a lot of these patients are now cured or their disease is under control with just one oral tablet every day. Another thing, for example, this is the case of melanoma, though this cancer is not common in India. This is a very common cancer in US and you can see a melanoma spread across the body. This has a beer of mutations basically and when we use we are the, the, you know, the medicine which can prevent uh, this or uh, inhibit the mutation, we are mutation, basically Vemurafenib, you can see there's a complete response uh, of this patient within a few months. But very importantly, actually, you know, this is very short lasting in many of the target therapies, the cancers are so intelligent that they bypass one pathway and then you can get the disease back. And many times this disease is more aggressive also. So we are trying to learn how we can use this targeted therapies to the best of our knowledge, but it is it is still in, in we are in the learning curve. But the other way around, you can see this is now outcome of patients with lung cancer with chemotherapy. Now this was you know basically we have used various types of chemotherapy: cisplatin plus paclitaxel, cisplatin plus gemcitabine plus docetaxel, carbo plus paclitaxel. But very interestingly. The outcome of all these patients, this is advanced lung cancer patient, the median survival was just eight months. So whatever we did, the outcome was very poor. And that's why now over the years now, we have a lot of research has gone uh, into this uh, lung cancer. And we have so many new targeted therapies available uh, to us that, you know, we can talk and talk about this, but just I'll give you a brief example. For example, this is osimertinib. This is a, again an EGFR mutation patient. So this is a patient with even brain metastatic disease. And you can see after the treatment, this is a basically near complete resolution of this patient and a very good response. So with just oral tablets, you can control. And very importantly, this is like I told you in the first figure, the median survival used to be eight months. And now you can see here, this is even at two years, it is still, we have not reached the median survival. So nearly 60, 65% of the patients are alive even at the end of two years. 
So it has made a drastic change, not overall in all lung cancer, but in a subset of cancers in patients where we know the driver mutation. If you use the targeted therapy, we have crisotin, we have ALK inhibitor for the ALK patients, we have ALK mutation, we have EGFR mutation specific treatment for that. So once we know what the driver or driver mutation is, then we can target them appropriately and try to improve the outcome. So basically, these targeted therapies interfere with the protein and other molecules involved in the growth and development of cancer cells and try to reverse the defects of the cells, which enables the cells to uh, basically stop dividing or reverse the defect and cells are induced to die. And that is why now we are getting a lot of, we are, there are so many pathways involved in cancer and we are trying to target various pathways through various molecules which are under process, many of these are already in the market and uh, you know some of them are and every day we are getting a new molecule which is available. And lastly actually we like I told you the other thing that has come up a lot in treatment of cancer is the immunotherapy that we have different types of immunotherapies for example here we have antibodies so we, we can target patients who have the or the cancer cell which express these antibodies you can target and not only that, this star, these antibodies can even be targeted with or tagged with radioisotope material, which BRC is trying to even help us in doing that. Through that, if you target tag this radioactive material to the antibodies, even the efficacy will be much better, and we are doing that. Then we can have even bispecific antibodies. That means ultimately you want the T cell to come near the tumor cell. And what we do is basically this uh, bispecific antibody has uh, CD3, which is a T cell uh, receptor antibody, and CD19, which is expressed on the leukemic cells uh, uh, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And when you give this bispecific antibody, it brings the T cell to the nearer to the leukemic cell and try to kill it. So there are various ways we can use this. And lastly, we have the basically the uh, you know antibody, uh, the immunotherapy, which is uh, more specific to this anti -CD, CD, CDL4 and basically checkpoint inhibitors, what we call. And this again helps to improve the outcome of stress, strengthen the immunity of the body. And you can see here, this is the first time, this is again melanoma, where we used to have a line which was just here, you know, within two years or one and a half, two years, all patients used to die. You can see that at least 30, 40, 60 percent of the patients are doing well, even at the end of three and four years. So this is something which we have never seen in the past, which we are saving, but seeing now. But again, you have to be very, very careful which patients you are using this. And this chimeric antigen receptor of the CAR T cell, and you must have read in the papers or at least in the in, on the Facebook and Twitter, Tata Hospital just did the first CAR T cell therapy in the country, and it was developed by you know Dr. Rahul Purwa at IIT and Dr. Gaurav Narula at our center. And together we have developed this Indianized car, which will help us again to improve the outcome of especially patients, not only blood cancer patients, but in the future also solid tumor patients. And this is the first car was there in 2012, and it is now commercially available. The commercially available one costs around 4 crore rupees, but we hope that it Tata will develop it in around 15 to 20 lakhs. And this is the team that has done that. And it's very important, you know, this uh, India is a country where you see Audis also on the road, but also bullock carts on the road and people walking also on the road. So for India, we need to, not only we need to have a, you know, a proton therapy and a CAR T cell therapy available, but at the same time, we have to take care of the general population also. And that is why Tata, we are also doing what we call the metronomic therapies or drug repurposing or repositioning where we are using very, very cost-effective treatment we are developing so that we can treat many of the common cancers which are there in the country. I am not spending time on that, but we, keep, we have to keep in mind that at Tata, 70-80% of the patients that we see are general patients, and we have to make sure that we also cure as many of those patients as possible. So this, Gaurav, we just covered, so basically, you know, many of the cancers in India and in the world are preventable. So this is from American Cancer Society. So if you eliminate tobacco use, undergo cancer screening tests, reduce level of obesity, overweight, improve nutrition, increase physical activity, 
you can prevent many many at least half of the cancers and very importantly change in lifestyle again which was covered by gauravi but i wanted to stress again on this before concluding that nutrition exercise de stressing yoga meditation will power positive attitude all this helps to prevent cancer and if you can, now if you have can somebody has cancer to get a good outcome out of this cancer so these are very very important in the armamentarium of how to treat cancer and nutrition again plenty of water natural antioxidant foods vegetable soup salads anti cancer foods like broccoli soya sprouted pulses colorful foods all these are very important we very very importantly we don't encourage the artificial multivitamin tablets because studies have shown that multivitamin tablets can even increase the incidence of cancer so we natural foods are the best way to prevent cancer and to have good outcome of cancer again avoiding fatty foods is important all the white food you know whether it's refined you know sugar or it's refined atta that is maida or it is refined oil or any of this white food salt anything white is not good for the body so that is basic thing that you have to keep in mind and even like this a milk you know a2 milk which is there it has a slightly yellowish tinge so you know all the absolutely white thing polished rice you take anything white is not good for the body so you have to keep that in mind and try to eat as much as possible colorful food and avoid red meats that is very very important because red meats can especially colon cancer and other type of cancer can increase with that so the last slide that i will tell is that basically you know the doctors tell us that there are certain diseases that are incurable do you know what an incurable disease is it is the one that doctors don't know anything about because the disease has no objection to being cured at all and this is very very important because many of the cancers which were incurable when i was a resident are not totally curable and i'll just end with the example like when i was a resident there was a disease called acute promyelocytic leukemia it's a type of blood cancer we used to dread because if these patients came they required tons of blood and platelet lot of supportive care and to cure them even not only intensive chemotherapy but even bone marrow transplant and this is the data from memorial sloan catering which is the best at that time and even now one of the best cancer centers you can see the outcome was around 30 35% with the best of treatment and really intensive very costly treatment but you can see now the same disease we are using just oral medicine now we have oral transretinoic acid and we are oral basically you know we are, you know the oral therapy uh, arsenic trioxide so arsenic and retinoic acid both are now available oral and you can see with just oral therapy without even admission nowadays nearly 100% or more than 98% of these patients can be cured so very importantly it's not you know that the cancer is not curable we used to call them incurable cancer but now there is burkitt's leukemia burkitt's lymphoma all these cancers which were hardly curable and when we were resident now have more than 90 95% cure rate so it's very important that we understand the biology of cancer and basically you know see how we can change the way we treat and maybe cure a more uh, patients with cancer thank you very much uh, thank you dr um... Gauravi Misra and uh, Dr. Sripad Vanawali for nicely explaining to laymen's about uh, uh, prevention, early detection, diagnosis, and uh, treatment. Uh, uh, with your kind permission, doctors, I will uh, uh, now open the chat box, which is retrieved from both uh, YouTube as well as Webex. Um, yeah. I request you uh, to reply or to answer their queries, sir. Yeah. There are. Uh, 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 sir, uh, doctors, we can read on your. No, I think if, uh, if we are not able to see, we will read it. Uh, can I? About. You are able to see? Yeah, I can see the chat box. Can I take the question in the chat box first? Yes. 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 So there's a thing of any information about second or reincidence of cancer. especially in radiation treated children so definitely there was you know see the initial radiation therapy was gross that means the, the 
what you call, you know, the photon based therapy, where we used to not only that, it was more non specific. That means there used to be a lot of spill of radiation to the normal tissues also. So, especially in growing children, when they get exposed to radiation, many of these children can get long term effects like a second malignancy. Not most of them, but where, you know, nearly say 7 8 percent of certain sarcomas, etc., retinoblastomas used to get second cancer. So now we are using less and less radiation in children and, uh, you know, using highly specific and, uh, you know, localized treatment of, uh, like we are, I told, showed you that. So with that, uh, you know, we are, we have seen less and less numbers of second cancers in children. But we, like I told you, as much as possible, we are avoiding radiation in children and where it is absolutely necessary, we are taking precaution to make sure that we don't cause or cause as less long-term side effects as possible. So, okay, we can go to the next question. So, can long-term use of AI and AI is what, aluminum and non-stick cookware cause cancer? Gaurav, you would like to take that? Yeah, uh, so uh, basically there is... Uh, no evidence as such that uh, uh, certain kind of uh, cookware or non-stick cook use of certain uh, kind of cookware does lead to cancer or not. What we talk about uh, uh, here is uh, the evidence base for which there is enough research done and that we have an evidence regarding the same. So there is no such evidence uh, regarding uh, non-stick cookware causing cancers. And uh, I would like to address this also, which is the most common cancer uh, in India. We, I think uh, we spoke about it. In males, it is the oral cavity cancer. And in women, it is the uh, breast cancer. And uh, what is the easily detectable biomarker? I don't think we go in for a biomarker-based screening. Uh, because uh, the thing is that uh, there is no need for a biomarker-based screening. The screening is easily done by clinical breast examination. That is... Uh, uh, examination of the breast by a trained um, healthcare provider. Uh, it may be a trained nurse, a trained doctor, a trained surgeon who is performing the examination, but that is the method for screening and early detection and not for biomarker. We can, I mean, there are bio, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 tests available for uh, screening, but that is not adv advocated at all. It will lead us nowhere. So uh, basically what is advised is clinical breast examination, mammography. These are the tools that are advised for screening and not biomarkers for the breast cancer screening. So our eyes and hands are the best tools for detecting this cancers early. And these are like, what we told, highly detectable cancers. So, you know, basically we have to do screening for this, or even self-screening or self examination for both oral cavity and the breast would be helpful. Uh, Dr. Banavali and, uh, and Dr. Mishra, uh, I don't know who would answer this question. I have this doubt. Uh, is there any uh, idea whether any type of cancer can be genetic or no? All of them are acquired. That's my question. So, uh, what the are the particular yeah, type so, of cancer? Is you know, so two things here. So, all cancers are genetic. Genetic, for example, there is some part of genome, some part of pathway involved in formation of cancer, but that doesn't mean these are hereditary. So, there's a difference between genetic and hereditary, you know. So, genetic means there is some, you know, the genes control the, the pathways of, you know, of the cell division and the survival and many of these when they are affected you get cancer so genetically there is there may be mutation there may be a lot of defects in the genes but these are not hereditary very very small percentage which we again covered last time are hereditary cancers like those who have BRCA or P53 mutations or you know certain which runs in, in the families but otherwise yeah many of them will be genetic. We, we can we cannot see the other questions in the okay. uh, one of the most dreaded cancers which you know about which uh, people have come to know mainly through films 
is leukemia or uh, blood what they call as blood cancer and it is uh, it is generally believed that it can be it can happen even to very very young people uh, what is the kind of incidence in india and uh, what is, what is the cause of uh, leukemia yeah you know so that is where area where i work so you know the commonest cancer in children is blood cancer so the cause is acute lymphoblastic leukemia so third you know in children 30 35% of the cancers are leukemias so it's the commonest cancer in children but you know the overall if you see out of 100 cancers that we have around four are pediatric cancers so the overall the incidence of cancer in children is very very less but among the cancers which they develop they are 50 50 so half of them would be blood cancers half of them would be solid tumors and in adults around 20% of the adult cancers are blood cancers and blood cancers is both leukemias and lymphomas so they are there but the other part of it is yeah the treatment that you require for many of these is quite aggressive especially the present day like i told you you know so what was very aggressive treatment now we are treating on outdoor basis not only that if you see chronic myeloid leukemia which you know 90% of our patient will die within the first 3 4 years now 95% of our patients are alive even at the end of 20 years so it has changed everything is changing not only that acute myeloid leukemia which at present is treated very aggressively outcome is low now at the md anderson they have started treatment with oral treatment just not the the type of treatment that is but there are other drugs which are you know hypomethylating agents and uh, the venetoclax as a oral ntbcl2 uh, uh, you know substance so these are oral medicines and now they are using uh, you know flet3 inhibitors so they are using oral medicine to treat the worst type of cancer like acute myeloid leukemia which is one of the most aggressive cancer so you know once we know how to treat them all this criteria of very aggressive or poor outcome will change because Though blood cancers are very uh, aggressive and all, especially the acute ones, they are also highly curable. So in pediatric, I told you, ninety percent plus of pediatric leukemias are totally curable, and in adults also now slowly it is improving. So many of the cancers like lymphomas, Hodgkin's disease, these are highly curable cancers. So they are aggressive, but the aggressive say, cancers also divide fast, so they are amenable. to treatment which kills them so you know the other way round the highly aggressive tumors are also highly curable cancer probably somebody has asked a question on same that what are the symptoms of leukemia is it uh, is possible detected very early yeah or no yeah so it can be seen in the usa for example now cancer leukemia that detected when there is 2000 4000 8000 that means counts within the normal range in india it takes time because the commonest symptom for uh, for blood cancers is fever you know now fever can be because of so many other things so it's a common symptom is non specific what you call symptom or you have glands but you know what we say now is that normally any fever a child has or even adult within a week or 10 days it should resolve so something that is not resolving within a week or two definitely you have to keep your antennas up and make do a good examination see if there are glands palpable if the liver is enlarged the spleen is enlarged or if there are red spots what we call petechia purpura so all these things if you see within 2 weeks now if you are now if you the fever doesn't respond you have to or even generalized malaise decrease in appetite we have to at least do a good complete blood count which is a simple test available everywhere all throughout the country but you have to tell the pathologist to look under the microscope because nowadays with these automated machines now you get full report so very few times you see under the microscope but you have to request here to the pathologist to see the slide under the microscope what we call manual differential count so that you can diagnose this early but you are right now you can now diagnose though the symptoms are non specific if it continues for some time and does not resolve that differential diagnosis of blood cancer has to be kept in mind but at the same time we don't want to you know the people should not be be afraid also because any fever is not blood 
Now, out of the thousand times you have fever, nine ninety nine times it is not blood cancer. So it doesn't mean that every person who has blood who has fever or weakness should be evaluated for cancer. But if the symptoms go on for two to more than two weeks, you have to at least look for it. So it not every time we'll get uh, that the patient has a cancer. Doctor, you showed some pictures of children with uh, cancer in the eye and they were looking very, very uh, difficult for us to digest. Now, ch uh, this could not have come from any bad habit or anything else. How, how such cancers can be caused in children? What can this be is retinoblastoma is a cancer in children only. You don't get retinoblastoma yes. usually above the age of 5-6 years. Very rarely, or it's nearly very impossible to get. So most of the cancer, the eye cancers, retinoblastoma occurs in young children, and this is one of the hereditary. Some part of it, though not all, around 30, 40 percent of this retinoblastoma is hereditary. That means the retinoblastoma gene is affected. So you know, basically, then the more if you have hereditary type of thing, then you get even at birth. We have diagnosed retinoblastoma even before birth or even just after the birth. So it can occur any time within the first two, three, two years in, in the hereditary variety. And overall, less than five years, most of the cancer retinoblastoma would be diagnosed. And that was a child from Tata itself. You know, we somebody told the patient, this is years back though, like I told, nowadays we don't remove the eye, but this patient was had gone outside, was told to have uh, basically enucleation or removal of the eyeball, the parents ran away, went to, you know, coax and even other, you know, people who told that, oh, they can cure without surgery and ultimately the child's retinoblastoma is a very aggressive and fast-growing tumor. It is one of the most fast-growing tumor in the body. So, you know, it really developed fast and this patient came within a few months after that with this, the, eye, the whole eyeball popping out of the eye and, but luckily for us, we have hardly seen such patients in the recent times. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, there there can be cancers which are not stage-specific uh, with regard to progress. The person is asking about ovarian cancer. In such cases where there is no stage-wise uh, progress and all that, how, how, uh, what is the prognosis about detection? Gauri, you want to take that? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, ovarian cancers, normally we don't screen ovarian cancers. Uh, uh, the basic uh, way to detect it, uh, detect it early is by doing a sonography, but then you cannot go do a sonography for all the women and uh, to screen for ovarian cancer. So we do it for symptomatic women, women who are complaining of either abdominal distension or bloating continuous or disturbed menstrual cycle. Uh, there's an abdominal distension. In those cases, we do a sonography and uh, that's the time we come to know that there's an ovarian tumor and then we do certain biomarkers to see whether it's an uh, ovarian um, cancer um, or not. Uh, but um, more importantly, um, the, the treatment is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the debulking has to be done because it's quite uh, uncomfortable uh, for the women. And uh, then the definitive treatment is also administered. So, uh, uh, as such, ovarian cancer, it's not a cancer that is uh, screened among women in general. The general screening is done only for breast and cervical cancer. Ovarian cancer is done in specific conditions wherein there's a family history or uh, the woman is complaining and giving certain complaints wherein uh, we associate it with uh, ovarian cancers. In that case, we'll be going for a screening. Okay. So, Here's a question on... Pulmonary no. fibrosis. No, before can you, can you... there's one more before that. What are the available treatment for DLBCL when it is in advanced stage? So DLBCL is a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it is a type of blood cancer, and chemotherapy is there for the like uh, the uh, when you diagnose a cancer, uh, you know new cancer for example. But after when it is advanced stage, that means especially if it comes back, you know, our chemotherapy is to be not that effective. But now we have a lot of newer therapies which have come for the advanced, especially the recurrent type of cancer. And that is basically the immunotherapy. So we have both now 
the you know the antibody the therapies which are there as well as basically the the you know the checkpoint inhibitors i told you that you know there are checkpoint inhibitors which are type of immune therapies which are very very effective in this group of patients and the third addition which has come recently is the car t cells you know though all these treatments are still new for india but within a short time they will become you know will be really available to us and become will be using them more and more but very good effective treatments are coming up in patient with advanced recurrent uh, lymphomas and these are the immune therapies and uh, you know it will change the way we treat our patients in the near future it has already happened in the west but it will take some more years in india to do that but it's available for somebody who can afford it and the, do we stop pulmonary fibers so talk about somebody rock electrochemical techniques yeah electrochemical or you want to take that early detection so uh, uh, we do lot of uh, uh, techniques uh, wherein the the computerized techniques are used for uh, early detection of oral uh, pre cancers uh, wherein uh, we do uh, computer based pla placing the probe on the uh, site wherein uh, it is suspicious and looking at the electro uh, electric uh, 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 and uh, variations on the computer in the form of a graphs and uh, but those are uh, more of modalities of research based they are not commonly used uh, for screening purposes uh, at the population level or in the clinic as such there are lot of such techniques which are still in the research mode and um, they are being evaluated so maybe give a few years and uh, you know we will get it but at present none of uh, actually i have been you know approved for use in the clinic but there are a lot of lot of work is going on in this but give uh, in a few years we will be seeing it used in the clinic and the pulmonary fibrosis okay. basically take one last question is on fibrosis yeah uh, somebody has asked the pulmonary fibrosis is progressed a lot even what is the uh, risk factor for the person to get develop, develop cancer yeah you know unfortunately most of the patients who develop pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease they die of that disease very few of them really progress to cancer because the cause most of the time the cause is different it is mostly you know in india especially in the, and in cities one new thing that is coming out is the pigeon droppings you know and this is causing more and more patient we are seeing the of interstitial lung disease and uh, you know basically but it's not related to cancer so you know so smokers who have pulmonary fibrosis they may develop to a certain extent but this is usually we you know it's, uh, it's a different type of disease and there are newer drugs so there are drugs which may cause reversing of the fibrosis but again these are still in experimental uh, or yeah, early phase phase 2 studies and all only one phase 3 study in new england journal was published recently but all these drugs also have lot of side effects also but at present you know the lung cancer is a different thing and uh, pulmonary fibrosis is different um uh, thank you dr uh, uh, gautami uh, uh, gauravi uh, misra and uh, dr sripal banawali for uh, uh, nicely mm -hmm. explaining the our participant about the uh, different aspects of the cancer uh, right from the prevention to up to the treatment uh, and also answering the many queries uh, uh, which our participants are having and uh, clearly clearing their doubts i thank you again sir, sir and madam for nicely uh, 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 conducting the sessions and um, thank you again thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you for the chance. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to all participants.